Digby. I feel like this is deja vu. We've seen this before. Digby to Oval. Oval back to Digby. Digby back to, guess who? Oval. Oval takes it down below. Gera. 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 Intercepting the pass in the neutral zone. Dugans is still on the near side boards, working it, trying to work that buck. It's under a Odessa body. Over to Old Gera. Old is to dig me. I feel like this is a job. Old is to dig me. Old is to dig me. What? Old is to dig me. Back to get some money. Old is Mark. Well, snacks. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. Morning and happy Friday morning. Morning and happy Friday morning. Groups. The ticket. Episode 15, and we have a very special guest here, Mr. Norm Hitzkus. Good morning, Norm. How are you? Things are really good these days. Yes, they are. Well, Norm, we wanted to, to start off the top and just kind of say thanks to you for being that uh, consistent voice uh, and source of sports material or sports information for for me and Sam going back, gosh, what, Sam, the 80s? 80s for me. Oh. And so. Now, now you're making me feel older, lads. <laughs> well, that was just last week, as far as I'm concerned about the 80s. <laughs> I mean, that's just a hot minute. But uh, a, a common friend of all of ours, and I don't mean to name drop off the bat, but a common friend of all three of us is your former intern, Mr. Michael Gruber. And uh, we all know we all met him through our musician circles on, on our side of the fence, Norm. And one of the first things he ever asked me was, so how did you become a P1? You know, how, how did you fall into this gag? And I said, well, actually, I was imported from Norm. And he, he did a double take. Like, Excuse me? And I said, well, when I first moved here in the mid 80s, I listened to Cliff with my dad every single morning on the way into school. And I, I've been a Norm P1 since the mid 80s. In fact, I think you were doing a, I think around about the, the early 90s, you were doing some kind of a promotion. I think it was for Can Academy, where you, um, it, for a fee, a, a nominal fee, you could call in and request Norm to leave an answering machine message. And this, these are inventions that used to have uh, sounds of when we're not around our house only. Uh, and, and you called in and I just, I remember being 12 years old saying, wow, Norman, it's, he's called my house, man. And he knows our name. <laughs> oh, those are glorious years. I love those years. Back then I was doing the talk show in the morning and doing Ranger baseball or Maverick basketball on TV at night. And it, those were crazy times. They were also, uh, years of sleep deprivation that I'm now paying for. <laughs> well, Norm, you, you've always been involved in charities and, and you've been real giving of your time. Um, and so tell us a little bit about, I want to talk first, because this is just wrapped up, Normathon. How, how did you start that? And uh, how did we do this year? How much money was raised for, it's for, still for Austin Street, right? Yes, well, it's, I guess to go in reverse, I'm just astounded by what this turned into. It began 20 years ago when I was sitting with my friend and producer then, Mark Friedman. I had just arrived at the ticket about, oh, maybe a year, year and a half ago. Uh, and Mark had been my producer, KLIF. And so I brought him, quote, downstairs with me to the ticket. And we're sitting talking about how could we make a charity impact on something? So Mark says, how about a, a, a normathon? And I said, a what? He said, how about a marathon that we call a normathon, where you broadcast for 24 hours? And I said to him, are you crazy? <laughs> and we talked about this, and then we actually did it. And the first year, I think we raised $48,000, and we were just so proud of that. And, and then we did another one and another one. And, and along about year four, we started to realize that 
people didn't give much money at 3.31 in the morning. Uh, so we, we reduced it to 18 hours, and then it's been cut back to 16 hours. But then we started raffling a car, and then two cars, and then three cars. And then we had the idea for the 12 days of Christmas, auctioning off big items on the show for the 12 days leading up to Christmas. And this year, we reached $732,000. Um, it is the second highest total we ever had because two years ago, we reached eight eight hundred and thirty. But for the seven years, we've now reached a little over $7 million. And it, we have become basically the backbone of Austin Street, which is an extraordinary place, just an extraordinary homeless shelter. That's amazing. That, that That's like the the money you've raised, is, it's got to outweigh any charitable golf tournament or any other. It's got to be the, <laughs> the biggest yielding um, charitable sports related event in, in DFW history, probably. Am I wrong, Sam? I can't think of anything at least related to radio or media that would that would come close. But I mean, let's ask the Colonel the Rev, Mr. One Nineteen, is it? <laughs> one nineteen, yes. And I'm glad I got that one right. <laughs> so I missed that one. <laughs> what, what are your stats on that? What, what, I mean, I would imagine you would know more than most. <laughs> one nineteen leads the ticket. This is emergency breaks where you screw up on the air. The 119 is so far and away in first place. I I don't I think George Dunham may be second at like 53 or something. Well, oh like, my I mean can it can a golf tournament even come close to touching you even the Cowboys? I don't I don't no. think so. No. No, it it can't. I don't no. think so, but you know, it I don't the rankings really uh really Sam and Chad really don't don't matter that much to me. It's it's what has happened at Austin Street, where they take no money from the state, they take no money from the federal government, they they don't even take money from United Way, because of the the it's not anything against United Way. It's just there's so much red tape involved right. that you must wind up paying for in one way or another. But they exist on private donation and. Now, people from all over the country come here to study Austin Street to see how they're doing it, <laughs> to see how they're able to take care of. I, I you know, when people think about a, a, a homeless shelter, you think of, you know, some really nice, kindly people taking care of 12 people or 18 people or something like that a night. Austin Street will sleep 350, 375 a night. They feed them, they clothe them, they job train them. If they help count, if they need help with counseling, they do that. If they need arrangements getting to work, they do that. They research the backgrounds of the people that come in to see what they may have coming in the way of benefits. It's just an extraordinary place that, their goal is to move people out of homelessness. And last year, they moved hundreds of people out of the shelter, into apartments, and into jobs, where they're now, again, really paying their own way citizens in our area. And it's, it's just a, it's an unbelievable success story. Well, that is, that is amazing that uh, they do such good work. I mean, it, it's often... Good news is often not reported as much as bad news in today's world, it seems. Amen to that. But Norm, I, I have a question for you, which is, I mean, you've had a long and, and awesome career uh, in TV and radio. It, it, clearly, talking sports is in your DNA. The ticket. Hey, do, are you want to have the path of like a Larry King and talk all the way until you just can't anymore? Or are you going to be more like Reiner or Letterman and find a line in the sand and say, that's it? I'm out. Um, you know, recently, I've I've pondered what the rest of my life is going to look like. I encountered some pretty substantial health problems last year um, it, when I was diagnosed with bladder cancer and had to have two surgeries to remove tumors. But 
but right now I'm fine. And I, I believe I'll be fine. Uh, my doctor's very encouraging in that regard. And I, I look at my life and I think, what would I do if I retired? And I will take you back to when I was a very, very young man, starting out as a reporter with Channel 4 in Dallas <clears throat> right at uh, 48 years ago, okay? And I went over to the Colonial to cover the Colonial Golf Tournament. Excellent. And, and that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I wanted to do a feature on Julius Boros. I don't know if you remember that name. Okay. He, was, he was a wonderful old guy. And then there was no seniors tour. So if you were 50, 55, 58, 60 years old, and you wanted to play on a golf tour, you had to play on the PGA tour. There was no senior tour, champions tour. So there was Julius still out there golfing away and, and getting up in, up in years so I went out to do a feature with him and I met him at the golf course on Saturday we prearranged this and he said okay uh, I I've got a tea time tomorrow morning at like eight o'clock he was the first one off on Saturday morning he barely made the cut and he, he said uh, uh, meet me at the colonial so I meet him as he's walking off the 18th green he's handing everything his cap his his gloves he's He's taking his shoes off and handing them to his caddy and, and walking in his bare foot to get to the locker room to get his shoes. And he said, I, I'm, I'm sorry. He said, how long will this take? And I said, we'll only take about 10 or 15 minutes, Julius. He said, that's good because I'm due to meet a friend of mine at, t I think, 12, 15. And I thought, wait a minute. You're playing in a PGA tournament and you made a date to meet a friend of yours. <laughs> and I said, he, I said, uh, he said, yeah, my, my friend and I are going to go fishing. And I thought, dear Lord. Anyway, I asked him the question about retiring. And he said, basically, what would I do if I retired? I would play golf and fish. And that's what I do right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought the same thing about myself, that if I retired, what would I do? I'd get up early in the morning. I'd devour the sports page. I'd go through the internet looking for things and reading it. And then I'd probably call somebody to talk sports with. Well, that's <laughs> what I do now. And they pay me for it. The ticket. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great, that's a great story. Very relevant. And, uh, and, and a great answer. Yeah. It's, for some people, it's like, uh, musicians. We talk about that all uh, in the office here. It's, it's, how long will the Beatles, how are the Beatles, how long will McCartney, how long will the Rolling Stones keep playing forever? Because if they're not playing in front of a crowd, what are they doing at home? Probably. I, I have the same Thanks. question for you about another person that I really admire. Most of this year, I've wondered how Bob Seeger has felt. He was on tour for 50 years. And he sense. played his last concert last summer. I love Bob Seeger. Been to see him several times. And and I wonder how he feels now. Because that's been his whole life from when he was basically just out of out of adolescence to 75 years old. That's what he's done for his entire life. And I wonder how hard that must have been to give up now. We don't know if he was forced to give it up because man touring touring as a musician is really hard but how difficult to give up what you've always done at 75 or 77 or whatever age how difficult it is to give it up it's 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 hard Luck, luckily to tie it back into the the brahmas luckily in our league there's an age point at which you age out of the league. So none of the, none of the players keep going on forever here. They move on to bigger and better things. And when you retire, something bigger and better comes along. And who knows, are you ever really retired in today's day and age? Cause Bob Seeger, somebody could call him up and pay him a ton of money to do a tour. And he might say, what the hell, let's go for it. You know, he, 
He was scheduled to end his career in Detroit. I believe Clark Hall is where they played. And th- th- that sold out like a nanosecond. So they oh, said, yeah. well, we'll add one more concert. To the, to, we'll add a second concert. And that sold out like that. And so they said, well, you know, we'll add another concert. We'll, add, we'll, we'll do three to finish my career there. And I think he wound up doing four or five or, or even six because people just wouldn't let him go. They, they just wouldn't let him go. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to let go of something that, uh, yeah. that you love, you know. Well, Norm, we want to do a, a fun little segment with you here to wrap up called uh, Rapid Fire Crystal Ball. So we'll, right. we'll ask you some questions. We know you're a handicapper. They, they, they could be uh, sports-related. They could be purely um, opinion-related. We'll, we'll start with something near and dear to your heart. Who has the better sausage? Kubis or Jimmy's in Dallas? Oh, boy. Well, I, I have been a, a longtime Kubis fan. I have not had Jimmy's. What? No, I have not had Jimmy's. So I'm going to have to say Kubis only because it's the one I know. Okay. Well, I think Sam and I would, would agree with you there. Jimmy's for an Italian sausage is, is, is good, though. It's good, though. All right. Amazing. All right. Who had the better mustache in baseball? Keith Hernandez or Don Mattingly? Or Raleigh Fingers. Oh! oh. <laughs> That's why you're the Hall of Famer, Norm. You're right. <laughs> All right, how about this one, Norm? So, when their careers are over, which who knows when that'll be, who's going to have more rings on their fingers? Tom Brady or LeBron? Whoa. Let's see. Brady has six right now, right? Yeah. Brady, and he could get seven. So LeBron, LeBron I think, LeBron has four. Four. And he, he could get five this year. I'm, I'm going to say Brady. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> That's wrong. You're you're underestimating LeBron here because LeBron's going to play until the Lakers can arrange a trade so that his son Bronny plays with him. Absolutely correct. So he's going to play for four, five, six more years. Yeah. Good grief. Good question. Good question. Thank only you, Norm. Thank you. Only time will tell the answer mm-hmm. to that one. All right, Norm. Who's your favorite hockey player? All time. Gordy Howe. Yes. Gordy Howe. I grew up watching uh, Hockey Night in Canada on Saturday nights with the Foster Hewitt doing the play-by-play. Uh, and and Gordy Howe is a player that I grew up admiring. What a beast that man was. He's the only guy, I think, that has a, a stat line named after him, the Gordie Howe hat trick, a fight, an assist, and a goal. Pushed I, them together. I remember there was a, um, I, I think we even still call him Enforcer, uh, with the New York Rangers back then named Lou Fontanato. Oh, Lou Fontanato was a bad dude. And Lou, Lou would just fight like crazy. And he'd also do other things like crazy that broke the rules. <laughs> and and Gordy Howe was like, you don't touch the God. And Lou Fontanato cross-checked Gordy Howe and hurt him. Well, back then, there were only six teams in the National Hockey League. Right. So to make up a 70-game schedule, you played the other team 14 times each every year. Oh, my God, the people who hated each other in that league. Well, the when Fontenotto hurt Gordy Howe, the word was out. He will pay. Gordy Howe didn't need an enforcer, by the way. Gordy was his own enforcer. One night at Madison Square Garden, Fontenotto went behind the net to clear the puck. And... How's two line mates, as I recall, Normie Ullman and Alex Del Vecchio, came in on each side 
They didn't give a damn if the Rangers got the puck out of there and went up on an odd man rush. They were trapping Lou Fontenotto. And they trapped him behind the net. And Gordy Howe got in behind the net with Lou Fontenotto. And I, I am not a person who likes or enjoys violence. Gordy Howe beat the hell out of Lou Fontenotto. <laughs> if, if you ever get a chance to see the pictures, and they're available by going to the web. Oh, we'll find them. Of Lou Fontenotto after the Howe fight. And the referees were so respectful of Gordy Howe and realizing what Fontanato had done to Howe before that the referees just sort of stood there and said, you know, <laughs> we're going to probably let this one go on for about a minute or so. And, oh, boy. And I think it was the last time anybody seriously messed with Gordy Howe in his life. It's funny. The, the yes, the uh, the owner of the Brahmas, Mr. Frank Trezera, we love him. That's his team, the Rangers. So he might have some some more things oh, to say about this. He'll, which he'll, I'm excited. He'll have some memories there. Frank is also a big fan of the Texas Hall of Famers, so he, he's going to find this part of the interview very interesting, I'm sure. Indeed, and and Norm looks like we we're up against it. So I want to say thank you so much for your time. Uh, your presence on the air over all these years. We hope there's many more. And uh, I'm glad to hear your tumors are gone. That is huge. And uh, all the best. Also, next year for the Normathon, I'm going to reach out and we're going to we're going to donate some stuff to hopefully help uh, people making donations and whatnot. Hey, that's great, lads. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this. You call anytime. Oh, hey. thank you, Norm. Have a good one. You too. <laughs> and take two. Go. Yeah, right, I have a Lone Star Brahma's media team. I am not Chad Stewart. Instead, I am Graham Burke. And I am the goal. <laughs> okay. Alright, no, you're chill. Hey. Okay, I got it, guys. You're the best. You're the best. You're the best. Thank you, lads. Love well, you, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Enjoy your day. Barbasol contest or something? Something about shaving your beard contest. Okay. <laughs> It'd be funny, I should shave it and then like nick it like a thousand times. So I'm gonna like <laughs> <laughs> like Def Leopard G. <laughs> alright, alright, here we go, ready? And yeah. Double. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and take two. Go. <laughs> <laughs>